Okay, we welcome the next speaker for this session. Guy, right, please take a screen. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the speakers from uh, both the top and bottom of my heart. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, so, so uh, I'm going to talk actually not about uh, methodology, but I am in, uh, in, in this conference, it's a minority I'm talking about uh, uh, the, the non-mobile uh, impurity models. Uh, and uh, well, uh, let me tell you a little bit about my group. We, we work on algorithms for solving quantum many body problems of the types that uh, Xavier that was just talking about and other types. Uh, this is a partial cross section, relatively recent. And I'm going to talk about work done by uh, Andre, uh, a great postdoc who recently uh, has moved to uh, Ann Arbor uh, to work with my collaborator, Emmanuel Gould on a project that I won't be telling you much about today, uh, although I'll mention it. And what I'm going to show is the, the kind of smaller project that he did while in Tel Aviv. And uh, this is Tel Aviv, uh, you know, it's very nice. Uh, uh, Right now it's uh, it's Yom Kippur, it's the uh, Jewish Day of Atonement. So I, I will actually, uh, uh, even though we started a little bit late, maybe I'll not, uh, uh, I'll try to rush this a little bit uh, because right now this looks more like uh, probably those uh, Corona pictures of uh, totally empty uh, cities. And uh, if, I, if I go home too late, depending on which street I'll go through, I'll either uh, run through children with bicycles or, or people who will uh, throw stones at me. So uh, we'll try to keep it short. Uh, uh, the last talk uh, has helped me, right? I'm, I'm talking about transport through uh, uh, interacting junctions. So we have a metal, something in the middle where electrons interact and another metal. And this could be a mesoscopic junction or a molecular electronics junction. In a way, I don't really care. I look at this kind of uh, 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 spherical cow viewpoint of it. We just have a non-interacting bath, a small interacting impurity. Uh, in the case of an Anderson impurity model, that would be just one orbital and another interacting bath that may be at a different chemical potential. And uh, okay, so this is this is essentially the same uh, model that we saw in the previous talk. Uh, that's that's the one I'm going to discuss. So so we just have up to two electrons occupying the uh, impurity. Uh, if you have two electrons. Of opposite spins occupying it simultaneously, then you have a charging energy U, or Coulomb interaction, or Hubbard interaction, whatever you'd like to call it. Uh, then you have these non-interacting leads, which mostly we'll think of as one-dimensional, though they don't have to be. And uh, we have hopping, linear hopping between the uh, impurity and the leads. So uh, uh, just to talk a little bit about the method side of my group, right? What what we mostly do is work on uh, algorithms for solving these problems numerically exactly. Again, like uh, the one in the previous talk. Uh, and and uh, the algorithms that uh, we, we have gotten most uh, work uh, from recently are hybridization expansion. So this is also diagrammatic Monte Carlo. Okay, we're doing uh, Monte Carlo, regular uh, old metropolis Monte Carlo with no special numerical tricks. Uh, uh, summing over diagrams, and we're doing it in real time. And uh, actually, most uh, people doing this Monte Carlo, as was mentioned, do it in imaginary time and not in real time. That's because you get a horrible sign problem when you do it in real time. And we have uh, developed an algorithm called the inchworm algorithm, which gets around this uh, 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 real time sign problem, essentially by a kind of resummation. So we do a, a, a Monte Carlo process where uh, we use the fact that it's easy to do diagrammatic Monte Carlo for short time scales in order to make it easier to go to longer time scales. And then what you see uh, right here, for instance, we see the population on an Anderson impurity model, uh, which uh, starts in uh, the magnetized upstate. Uh, and at time zero, I couple it to a couple of leads and then the population evolves with time. And we're in this condo regime. So what happens in the condo regime to the population is that uh, a magnetic state is stabilized, it relaxes very, very slowly. And the, the time scale that, uh, that uh, characterizes the relaxation is this condo temperature, determined by the condo temperature. 
And if you just uh, do regular old uh, diagrammatic Monte Carlo in real time, uh, you will get the correct answer. But then after a short time, you'll start getting a lot of noise. And then your data won't be worth much. And if you look at how this noise grows as a function of time on a log scale, you'll see that it grows exponentially. Right? You get a pretty perfect exponent. And this exponential behavior is a sign problem. So our algorithm bypasses that. Uh, and again, I won't talk about how that happens today, but uh, uh, feel free to ask me, uh, you know, and, and I'll be happy to talk about it in private. Uh, the same kind of idea for bypassing sign problem uh, also works for some imaginary time sign problem. So, so generally imaginary time is easier, but in many cases you get sign problems as a function of uh, imaginary time or uh, inverse temperature uh, in certain hard problems. So one, one important kind of example in the DMFT or material science world uh, is multi-orbital impurity models, where instead of having just the single impurity Anderson model, you have a few uh, orbitals in there with some sort of complicated interactions and uh, uh, hybridizations between them. So electrons can hop through the bath from one orbital to another. And uh, uh, if you have that, then, then most of the regular diagrammatic Monte Carlo algorithms, uh, essentially, as you go down to long temperature, right, this is, this is uh, the continuous time hybridization expansion. This is kind of the state of the art for these multi-orbital impurity models. Uh, in a couple of uh, specialized models that we came up with. And uh, as I go down in the panels, I uh, decrease temperature. And then uh, you see that uh, essentially at some temperature, when the temperature is low enough, this method essentially starts giving uh, a horrible noise. You can analyze that to see that it's actually an exponent, the growth in the noise as a function of inverse temperature. And our, our method bypasses that. So we still get nice results uh, uh, as we go down to low temperatures. And it's the same kind of idea, again, which I haven't gone into, which allows us to go to long times. Uh, we, uh, uh, in our method, we actually do everything by time propagation, and it's quite expensive to go to long times. So unlike uh, Xavier's method, where they can really go to a very long time quite easily, because it's just, uh, it's just a regular Monte Carlo in certain ways, we have this uh, inchworm process where we have to do short time intervals and then uh, uh, edge, right, inch, we call it, towards longer time intervals. And that results in a computational scaling that is uh, like the square of time. So it can be expensive for us to go to longer times. Uh, and if we want to look at non-equilibrium steady states, that, that's, that's often right, quite hard. Uh, so uh, something that is Andre's main project, uh, and, and which I hope will be coming out soon, is a steady state in Schwarm Monte Carlo. We go directly to long times, to the long time limit. And uh, maybe I will spend just a couple of minutes explaining this. Uh, uh, essentially, these inchworm methods begin from, uh, uh, right, they, they produce uh, a hierarchy of approximations, uh, the lowest of which is the non-crossing approximation. So this is the same approximation that was uh, seen in uh, Marco, Marco Skiro's talk uh, a few days ago or sometime in this conference, right? Uh, and here, that is this uh, red curve. Uh, and, and what I'm plotting is the propagator, or let's, let's say it's the auxiliary object that appears in, these, uh, in this non-crossing hierarchy or hybridization expansion of approximations. So we have uh, uh, this sort of first order result. And in the Monte Carlo, we go to a relatively high order. Again, this is something which is uh, less than 10. I don't remember the exact order, but uh, it's not an extremely high order. Uh, but first order gives me this non-crossing approximation, which is already quite reasonable and it's, uh, it's conserving. It gives you uh, uh, okay physics, even though it's never really exact. Uh, second order is a one crossing approximation, which is quite expensive to do semi-analytically. And we can go to uh, say six, seven, 10th order, uh, 10 crossing approximation. And uh, these different curves that you see here are iterations. So the steady state inchworm is iterative, begins from the non-crossing result, then it corrects it every cycle and hopefully converges to something. So, so this, uh, this blur you see here, right? This bunch of lines that are close to each other are different iterations, right? Uh, 
uh, where we repeat the calculation. We get different noise every time. Uh, our input is the previous noisy, noisy output, and it converges to something. Uh, this uh, Kyan curve is what we get from doing the regular two-time inch worm and going to, to a very long time. Right, so this runs on a big cluster for a few days. It's, uh, it's quite expensive. Uh, whereas this, these black lines, they run on one core for about an hour. Okay. And, uh, uh, and, and then, you know, if, if we actually run this steady state inch form code on, on a small cluster, right, on 100 cores for, I think, a few hours, then we get the yellow curve. So inside this yellow curve, you can't see it, but you also have a few hundred curves, which are different iterations. And they're just uh, on this scale; they're, they're indistinguishable from each other because they're they're quite uh, they're quite close to each other. So we get very nice convergence, and essentially you can do these calculations, which used to take uh, you know big clusters for for a long time. Uh, we can do them quite easily. And then from this uh, propagator, we can actually extract Green's functions. So we don't have NRG uh, references here yet, but uh, we will soon. Uh, uh, but uh, you can see right essentially the correction from the non-crossing approximation to, to what we're doing. And uh, yeah, this, this should come out pretty soon, but it's a little bit too preliminary for me to talk about at length now. Uh, so that's Andre. Okay, Andre will be looking for a faculty position pretty soon, so we'll look out for him. Uh, and uh, the rest of this will be kind of a mini project that we did. So, okay, so, so uh, uh, getting back to this condo problem. Okay, uh, the way that the condo problem historically first emerged is that people were looking at uh, 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 transport in metals, right? Uh, resistance of metals. And you normally expect that when you uh, reduce temperature, uh, you will get better transport, right? Resistance will drop because you have this resistance from phonons, which is usually something like uh, temperature to the third. So. Uh, so so uh, it turned out that that wasn't the case in some cases when metals had some impurities. So that's first a little bit, right, from a classical viewpoint, it's not, not very intuitive, right? You think you have scattering from electrons, uh, from, from impurities inside the material. So you have, say, gold and you have some nickel atom stuck in there. So an electron would scatter from that. That has a cross-section, but there's no reason why that cross-section would become bigger as you lower the temperature. Uh, however, what happens is that you have this condo effect. So at low temperature, uh, a kind of screening cloud, right, a, a, a spin singlet cloud uh, forms around the impurity. And then electrons actually scatter off this object rather than off the atom. So you get a larger effective cross section. Uh, and therefore, what you see is that actually uh, resistance increases as you go down in temperature. Uh, and and uh, Right, that the whole the whole story of that uh, was was only eventually solved by by Wilson with numerical renormalization group, uh, and uh, uh, well, okay. So so without going too deeply into that story, uh, uh, the, there is this story of the cloud. There's this idea of the cloud that appears here, and in a way, we would like to see this cloud to image it, uh, maybe experimentally or to draw it theoretically. Right? We would like to know what it is that this uh, cloud is. And there's this idea which comes essentially from variational theories that it has a, a singlet nature. Uh, you also see this in energy. And uh, uh, well, okay, so, so, so first I, I wanna say, right, ha has this cloud actually been seen experimentally? Well, we have very good evidence that it's there. Okay, there, there are several experiments uh, uh, showing that there's something on that uh, length scale, at least. Uh, so this is a, a relatively recent one that uh, uh, right, might be considered the best. Uh, the title is Observation of the Condo Screening Cloud, right? And what they actually did uh, is they have a 1D system, okay? a 1D uh, mesoscopic system uh, with a quantum dot. And they are able to apply a small perturbation at different distances from the quantum dot. So what you get is a kind of a Fabry Perot cavity uh, with different lengths, which is coupled to a condo impurity. 
And uh, if you're interested and you want to see a slightly different viewpoint on this from, from a lattice model perspective, then I mean, this is a theory paper that uh, some of my collaborators have, uh, have written on, where I also participated. And there you can just think of this as a, uh, a series of uh, uh, non-interacting sites in a 1D chain coupled to your quantum dot. And uh, you have some coupling between the dots and the two chains. And on one of the chains, some distance from the impurity, the coupling between the two nearest uh, orbitals, the two nearest uh, atomic sites, is different from the coupling elsewhere. Okay, and that, that defines some sort of length scale. And it turns out that when you do that, uh, you modify the condo temperature. The condo temperature is a very sensitive probe of things that you change in the system. And then if that modification is, is far enough out, it will have no effect on the condo cloud. But if it's within the cloud, then it will modify things. So, so what they've done here is essentially scan uh, different distances and see how the condo temperature changes uh, as you move this, uh, as you scale the size of this cavity. Uh, and, and the length scale that they extracted from that is on the order of what you expect from theory to be this uh, Xi condo, right? This condo screening length. Uh, and again, you, you, can, uh, you can call this an observation of the condo cloud, but uh, it's an observation that something, some sort of, right, uh, thing, I don't know, exists on this length scale and is sensitive to perturbations on this length scale and is related to the condo temperature. Uh, it's uh, right, you, you can argue about whether this is, whether you're actually seeing a picture of the cloud, whether this is the cloud. Uh, so what, what would you kind of like as a, a smoking gun? Uh, well, we have this idea that the cloud is a singlet cloud, right? So you could think, uh, let's, let's try to actually measure uh, whether there is a singlet, a singlet between what and what. So an electronic orbital on the impurity and some other electronic orbital, right? It might be a spatial orbital, an atomic orbital somewhere else in space, and it might just be a, an orbital in energy, right? And it might be all the orbitals in the system, which is what's essentially done in energy. So essentially, conceptually, what you would like to do is take your system and somehow magically connect a quantum computer to it uh, and apply uh, one of the simplest uh, quantum circuits that, uh, uh, that exist, and then do a measurement. And this kind of measurement uh, will essentially tell you uh, whether there is a singlet between uh, spin here and the spin here. Uh, and if, if there is one, uh, uh, you could say that that is a result of the condo effect. In fact, that, that there, is a, there is a singlet even in the non-interacting system. Uh, actually, singlets are not as exotic as, as you might think because they're just, they're basis dependent. So if you're in a non-interacting system and, and uh, you know, the solution of your non-interacting Hamiltonian is delocalized in some basis, uh, and you measure a singlet in that basis, you will have some. So actually what we're interested in is, in this, is the extra singlet. Okay? It's the, the singlet that cannot be explained by single particle physics. And I'll talk a little bit more about this. Uh, but uh, as to whether you can actually do this experiment uh, in, in, in solid state, condensed matter, or mesoscopic physics, I, I think it's quite difficult. People have tried to do something uh, similar uh, in NMR by measuring uh, correlation functions, basically nuclear spin correlation function at different atoms. But uh, I think that no one ever managed to reach a sensitivity that was satisfactory. Uh, but uh, in ultra cold atoms, uh, that there are actually uh, some ways to do this. So you could actually construct this model essentially site by site uh, in uh, uh, optical tweezers, uh, insert some atoms that hop into it, and at certain parameters, at least you can explore this experimentally. And then you can uh, really uh, look at uh, uh, quantum gates between two different sites, and it'll be interesting to see if that's actually done. So, so uh, Yoav Sagi, my collaborator from Technion, also in Israel, uh, is uh, thinking in this direction. Okay, so, uh, how how do we actually do this in a, in a you know in a, this Anderson impurity model like Hamiltonian? Well, we have to take this idea 
of projecting onto a singlet state and write it in terms of the normal operators that we use to represent this model. Uh, and that's not uh, quite the same as projecting onto a two qubit state in a quantum computer, right? Because we have these, uh, right? The spins are actually just the charge zero state of these, uh, uh, of these local impurity subspaces. Uh, so we have to construct actually a, a rather high order uh, operator in order to, to write down a projector onto a singlet. But other than the fact that that's a little bit, uh, you know, uh, uh, it lacks aesthetics, it's not, it's not difficult conceptually and you can do it. And the way that uh, we wrote it, right, again, so, so you, you have to ask a singlet between what and what. So we write projector onto a singlet state with orbital chi, where chi can be any orbital. It can be a local orbital, uh, an atomic orbital in the lead, or it can be uh, uh, an energy state in the lead. And we'll see that both are, are kind of interesting. So uh, one more thing that you have to be careful about, uh, which I mentioned, is the, the, these uh, classical or non-interacting singlet correlations. Okay, uh, so, so if you think about just a few, uh, right, a bunch of tight binding orbitals and you fill them up with electrons and then you calculate projection onto a singlet between two of these, you will get a singlet. And that doesn't mean that uh, you, you built a, a large scale quantum computer or, or anything particularly interesting quantum mechanically, but it's there. So you have to remove that and it's, uh, you, you can do a little bit of analytics even to figure out what that should be. Um, but uh, let's say it's not, it's not very complicated. And then uh, essentially that means modifying one of these operators by this uh, simple topology factor. Okay, uh, now uh, we are not yet doing this exactly. Uh, we're doing this with the non-crossing approximation. Again, just like in Marco's talk. And uh, uh, just to mention this briefly because I don't want to go too deeply into it. We're doing an expansion in the hybridization between uh, the impurity and the leads. So it's exact at the atomic limit, at the limit where uh, the impurity is decoupled from the leads. And then we do perturbation theory and, and hopping between the impurity and the leads. Uh, but it's a self-consistent perturbation theory uh, in the sense that you can write uh, a hopping event as a kind of term in a Feynman diagram. These are not interaction expansion Feynman diagrams, they're hybridization diagrams. But uh, an element like this, like what I'm circling here, is a case where uh, an electron uh, moves between the dot and the leads. And then it turns out that you have to connect it in order to get a non-zero contribution to a case where another electron hops back in. Uh, you connect them with this hybridization line and uh, each hybridization line has a value, which is just this non-interacting Green's function. Uh, you can sum them all up, they form determinants. Uh, but if you sum up only cases where these hybridization lines don't cross each other in time, uh, then you get what is called a non-crossing approximation and you can write that as this simple sort of self-consistency condition. Uh, and you do that, we also do this on the uh, Keldish contour because we want uh, real-time dynamics. Uh, so so this, this is what it looks like on a single branch of the Keldish contour. And then uh, you, you have to propagate uh, you know, to, to both sides of the operator. Uh, so, so we have these two branches of the Keldish contour and you have what we call a vertex function, sometimes an MCA, uh, for which you can write a self-consistent equation. And, and uh, the only difference is that it lives on two, uh, two different time branches. Uh, so this, this so far is what you do in every MCA approximation, if you want just like a population or a Green's function or something like this. Uh, if you want to do this for this uh, uh, singlet weight, these singlet projectors, uh, and I should mention that we could also do triplet projectors just as easily, right? You could project onto any sort of interesting local uh, quantum mechanical state. Uh, then essentially uh, you express that diagrammatically. If, if you look at, uh, at these operators, then uh, these A operators, right? These are dot operators. Uh, I'll remind you from our Hamiltonian. I should have pointed that out probably. So these are dot operators and A's are lead operators. So wherever we have an A or an A dagger, we connect the hybridization line. Uh, and these select states on the dot. 
So the Ds and D daggers essentially are, are uh, like indices. And the A's and A daggers mean that you have to put in an endpoint for a hybridization line. So these turn out to be the kinds of diagrammatic representations of these uh, P and E operators. Uh, and within, uh, within the non-crossing, right? At the non-crossing level, that is essentially all you have to calculate. Okay, so you have uh, these very simple uh, uh, expressions for everything that you want. And it wouldn't be, uh, again, technically very complicated to, to make this numerically exact, but we haven't done that yet. Okay, it would be, of course, more computationally expensive. So for this, this kind of early exploratory thing, I think the non-crossing approximation is enough, and I'll show a benchmark or two. Uh, now, uh, I, I want to say that, again, this, this, this can be seen as some kind of a, right, a witness of quantum behavior, right? We think of a, of a singlet uh, as, as a quantum thing, right? It's a bell state. Uh, the same thing could be, right? People use also entanglement entropy for the same purpose sometimes. Divide the system into two parts and look at the entanglement between them. Uh, both of these things are to some degree basis dependent and uh, uh, don't necessarily tell you much about whether you have some usable quantum computation resource or anything like this, so you can argue about their usefulness. But this one is uh, at least in principle experimentally approachable at a large scale, right? Entanglement entropy, things like this are, are very difficult to measure. Even in small systems, you, you have some, some measurements of Remy entropy. But, uh, so this is a little bit more feasible, and theoretically, uh, it is not that difficult. Okay, so uh, uh, what I'm going to do, right, this is, uh, we can consider this detail, right, but uh, we pick some parameters for the model, right, essentially they're picked so that we are, uh, we have an easy to reach condo regime at a temperature that is not too low, and we have a bandwidth that is larger substantially than uh, the other energy scales in the system because we don't want to worry about it too much. And then we uh, uh, calculate these things. And just to get an idea of whether this non-crossing approximation is, is at all good, right? Uh, for short time scales, we can, because, because we're using 1D leads, we can solve the dynamics with a uh, uh, time dependent uh, density matrix renormalization group. TDMRG or, or MPS, uh, right? This is this is a basic TDMRG. Uh, you cannot go to very long time scales, but you can sort of see that, uh, right? Is this good or not? Uh, you can you can decide on yourself, right? That's kind of subjective. It's certainly not excellent, right? But uh, uh, what you would say is that NCA gives you kind of a qualitative, but definitely not quantitative result. Uh, and of course, right, we can improve this approximation. Uh, uh, Right. We, have, we have the technology to make it exact, but this is just exploratory. Okay, so, so what, what do we actually see at the uh, NCA level? So first, uh, I want to talk about uh, the energy picture, okay, where Xi, the lead orbital, is an energy space orbital, and uh, uh, we uh, are in equilibrium, so we don't apply any sort of voltage. So let's, let's focus first, right? The simple spot is this bottom right one. So here we are at equilibrium, we've equilibrated, uh, and we're looking at the singlet weight between uh, the impurity and different energies on the lead uh, at different temperatures. And what you can see is that at very high temperature, you get nothing. Uh, if there's a remnant signal, it's only this, uh, this non-interacting trivial signal that we've thrown away. Uh, at lower temperatures, approaching the condo temperature, you start to see peak, and then eventually a peak develops. Okay, and it's, it's nice that this is a very clean observable, right? You can't see much of these uh, sidebands or Hubbard peaks, uh, charge transfer peaks that you see in a spectral function. You, you just see a peak, if there is, uh, if you're in the condo regime. So it's kind of nice and quite clean. Uh, if you look at the time uh, evolution, then, uh, so, so look at these two. Time is going upwards. Time zero, we have no singlet correlations. And then we couple the system to the leads and let it evolve. So what happens then 
is that uh, eventually uh, some sort of uh, signal to correlation will form. This is shown at low temperature, so, so you will get this condo like central peak. And uh, 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 then what happens at short times depends on your initial condition. So if you start in a magnetized initial state, at first you'll have nothing, and then this peak kind of slowly forms. Uh, but if you start the dot empty, then at short times, there's this transient peak, which is much larger than the condo peak. So you see a very large singlet forming uh, very rapidly, but then it decays to nothing. So, so what is this, right? I, I mean, this doesn't seem to be condo-like, right? And it doesn't survive also eventually in equilibrium. So it's not at least the same as the equilibrium condo effect. But what you can imagine is that at short times, if your dot is empty and uh, some lead orbital uh, is doubly occupied, uh, so orbitals at this energy are doubly occupied, because orbitals are uh, occupied up to here, this is the Fermi energy, uh, then uh, say one of the uh, electrons in the lead orbital will enter the dot. And at that point, you will immediately have formed a singlet. Then once that happens, dynamics kind of slows down because you don't have this uh, uh, population-driven uh, mechanism for pushing electrons into the dot. So at that point, right, once, once an electron is in there, uh, in order to uh, decay this singlet correlation, what you have to do is, is exchange electrons. So you have to do spin flip events where an electron of one spin goes in, another goes out, or you have to do a virtual event, a higher order event. So these are slower, and this is the, exactly the kind of thing that's, that's quite suppressed by condo physics. So then you get a time scale for this decay, which is related again to the uh, condo temperature. Uh, so this is the transient effect. Uh, uh, this appears at equilibrium. Again, I, I don't think that there's, there's much new other than this transient effect, uh, but we'll come back to that when we talk about non-equilibrium and what happens there. Okay, so so yeah, so so from this essentially, what I want you to remember is right. This is a good probe for the existence of condo physics. Okay, now you can do the same kind of exploration in real space. Okay, so in one D, it's maybe uh, not the the doesn't make the prettiest pictures in the world, but it's it's quite simple to understand. Uh, so so this is essentially a site in the leads, a location in space. And this is time. And at time zero, we couple the impurity to the leads. And then we have some sort of, uh, uh, right, some sort of disturbance which moves along at the Fermi velocity, at the effect of right, the speed of sound here. Uh, and uh, not much happens outside of this light cone, right? You, you have all these rules for what can happen outside the light cone. Everything outside of it is exponentially suppressed. But inside of it, eventually, uh, something forms at short distances from the impurity. Uh, so for reasons I won't go into there, there's this odd even effect here, right? Uh, so, so odd and even sites are, are quite different from each other. So it's useful to separate them. And what you see then is that at low temperature, uh, a singlet forms around the impurity with a length scale that is essentially uh, the condo screening length. So this is essentially what you would expect. Uh, uh, and you see that as you go to higher temperature, this thing is suppressed. Maybe you have some remnant of it, but uh, not. it doesn't have this length scale inside it. Uh, and you can, you can see that there's a somewhat different behavior for odd and even sites, but uh, essentially they, they are of opposite sign. Okay, so all of this is equilibrium physics. Uh, now it gets a little bit more interesting when you turn on a voltage. So everything here actually uh, could have been done uh, with energy or DMRG at equilibrium. And people actually did some of this stuff with DMRG. Uh, but uh, I, I should say that in order to get these steady state things, you need about uh, 10,000 orbitals in the leads. Uh, so that, that's quite challenging to do with, uh, with these methods, even at equilibrium. Uh, but it's, it's very easy to do at a level like this NCA or, or even quantum Monte Carlo because essentially we don't care about the number of orbitals in the leads. Uh, okay, so, so, uh, so here's what happens when we turn on a voltage. Uh, 
so this essentially, right, this line here uh, is uh, the low temperature equilibrium curve that we saw in the previous set of results. And then as I go up, I uh, shift the chemical potentials in the two leads in different directions. And what you can see, right, so, so black is the equilibrium, right? And then if you add a small voltage, right, well, it's not that small here, but it's pretty small, uh, phi equals one, you see a sudden huge increase in the signals. So actually, right, there, there's this idea uh, that non-equilibrium will split the condo peak for a while, but it will also kill it uh, pretty quickly because you have a lot of dissipation due to non-equilibrium. But if you actually look at singlet correlations uh, between the lead and the impurity, you'll see that a small non-equilibrium uh, voltage actually increases them very substantially. Uh, and then uh, this peak will follow the chemical potential uh, in a particular lead. Okay, so this is, these are singlet correlations between the left lead uh, and, the, uh, and the impurity and they follow the right lead chemical potential. Okay, there is something happening at the left lead chemical potential, but it's a smaller effect. It's actually an anti-signal correlation. Right? You have fewer signal correlations than you would in the non-interacting case. Uh, so, so what is actually happening here? Right? So you have uh, singlet correlations forming in the left lead at the chemical potential of the right lead. Okay, my left lead is filled up to here. And here I have singlet correlations for me. And if you think about this a little bit, this is actually related uh, to this transient non-equilibrium effect that we saw here. But in non-equilibrium, this is something that can go on because you have electrons occupying the left lead orbital at that energy. They can go into the impurity and then the impurity is immediately drained into the right lead there. So this process can repeat itself and you can uh, continuously reform singlet correlations between your left lead and your impurity. Uh, and, uh, uh, and interestingly, that, uh, right, so, so is that related to the condo effect? It certainly, it happens in the same regime. And uh, one thing that you, that you can see quite easily is that if you go above the condo temperature, this is strongly suppressed, but it's not quite the same as the uh, condo effect. Right. In, in a way, it's a, it's a much simpler kind of process for singlet formation. Uh, but but I, I think it's interesting because right now, now when you think about this uh, uh, peak uh, splitting thing, which uh, Xavier has mentioned, which people have argued about for many years, like how can it be that a, a very small temperature will completely destroy the condo temperature, uh, the condo peak, but a rather large voltage will not uh, so, so it turns out that there's, there's some sort of competition here, right? There, there is something in the non-equilibrium uh, voltage that will to some degree enhance condo-like correlations. And that might be why, why this actually is happening. Uh, okay, and, and in non-equilibrium, you can also look at uh, the real space correlations. Uh, and again, I, I want to finish uh, soon, so I, I won't go too deeply into this, but what I want you to, to look at, right, if you compare this picture for a moment to this picture, right, uh, one thing that you can see is that the, uh, the, the behavior is quite qualitatively different. So in equilibrium, both for odd and even sites, uh, you see suppression. In non-equilibrium, right, so, so again, this is the behavior in voltage. I increase voltage as I go to the right. And this is the behavior in temperature. I increase temperature as I go to the right. So temperature suppresses uh, singlet correlations for both odd and even sites, but voltage will not actually that strongly impact them for the odd sites and will kind of flip them for the even sites. So this, this again, is a little bit really qualitatively different behavior. And also in real space, you see things forming. Okay, so, so there's a discussion that you can have about the combination of voltage and temperature, and you can see some of this in, in these plots, but I think, uh, uh, yeah, I think I should probably finish up at this point.
and just uh, accept questions. So, so just to summarize this, right? We we've looked at uh, projective measurements, right? So, so if you want to see if your system is forming a delocalized singlet state, like in Congo, or maybe a triplet state, uh, or maybe some other interesting uh, few orbital state that might characterize some sort of uh, uh, physical regime, uh, then then these things can be calculated some quite easily in these, these hybridization expansion type things. Uh, and, uh, and when you're doing that, then uh, going out of equilibrium can have rather dramatic results. Uh, so you have a very specific observable and uh, uh, its physics are, are, I think, at least somewhat surprising. And what we want to do in the future is try to see whether, uh, whether this interesting effect that you see here is actually an artifact of the NCA or whether it survives when you do a numerically exact treatment. And that'll take uh, a little bit more work. Okay, so I think that's it. Thank you. I have a question, if I can, Misha. Yeah. You? Yeah. Hi, guy. Um, uh, just a, a clarification about the, this. Um, I like a lot this projective measurement. Um, do you? Can you remind, uh, explain? Do you do it at the end? I, what is exactly the um, the protocol in the sense? Is there a rate of projection that you're doing, or you just project the final state on some? Uh, uh, because uh, to me, projection means something specifically, but I'm not sure I... I, I think so, so what you can think of is this, right? Uh, at a particular time t, right? You take your system uh, and you uh, uh, measure, uh, right? You measure uh, an overlap, right? With a wave function, a two-site wave function like this. And then you trace out everything else. Yeah. Right. So this would be the same as if you write, suppose you have a bunch of qubits in a quantum computer, right? And at a particular time, you take two of them and you measure them after applying a little quantum circuit, right? Okay. Okay. But so experimentally, you can do this by essentially measuring, uh, right? So, so you can do kind of quantum tomography, right? Measure all kinds of different correlation functions between different uh, spin projections. Or something like this on two sides. But it's, it's a sort of you, you measure and you you destroy destroy the system and okay yeah. I, I so see. You have, to do, you have to do more than one measurement uh, really. Okay. With the full thing. And and when you say singlet uh, is a singlet between the spin of the impurity and the spin of the leads. That's yeah, what you exactly. mean. I so see. A spin in one orbital on the lead, which might be a, a site and which might be a, a kind of molecular orbital of the lead. Okay. Localized orbital everywhere. Okay, okay, I, I understand. Thank you very much. Okay, other questions? Okay, if we don't have any other questions, we thank speaker again and I stop recording.